There's really never been anything else like it. And I think there will never be anything else like it. Between 1935 and 1943, a group of photographers working for the federal government set out to introduce Americans to America. There is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. Walker Evans, he said, what I was seeing through the camera lens when I was down south was something that was so exciting it almost would make you go mad. This program has been made possible in part by a grant from the Southern Humanities Media Fund supporting film, television, and radio programs that inventively explore the changing story and identity of the American South. It was a time of crisis and possibility, a time when photographers pointed their cameras toward the truth and created a portrait of a decade unlike anything America had ever seen. People who were suffering felt that somebody was speaking for them because they couldn't speak for themselves. If they had enough money to buy a paper or a magazine to see their pictures. The man behind the collection was neither a photographer nor a politician. Roy Emerson Stryker was an unlikely instigator who by sheer force of personality changed the course of documentary photography. You know, he was a magician, really. I would say he was just a lovely, clever magician. <laughs> Stryker sat me down the first day I got there and asked me point blank what I knew about Washington, D.C. I thought Washington, D.C. should be the seat of democracy. And he just looked at me and smiled. He said, I want to give you an assignment. Go across the street, there's a restaurant, eat, get yourself some lunch. After lunch, go across the street, there's a theater with a film I would like for you to review and tell me what you think of it. Then come back to the office. <laughs> Very odd assignment. So I hurried back from the Farm Security Administration, which is Independence Avenue on 14th Street. Stracker was sitting there in a chair. I said, well, how did it go? I said, I think you know how it went. He says, yep, I know how it went. What are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. What do I do about it? He said, well, what'd you bring that camera down here for? When Roy Stryker first came to work for the federal government in the summer of 1935, America was in the midst of a Great Depression. He was hired to direct a group of photographers working for a New Deal agency called the Resettlement Administration. Their job, at least initially, was to convince a skeptical Congress that the thousands of dispossessed farm families pouring across the country, like the Jodes and Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, desperately needed their government's help. But during a time when rural poverty was nearly invisible to anyone who didn't live it, President Franklin Roosevelt's radical New Deal programs were a tough sell on Capitol Hill. 
The New Deal really has to be understood not just as an emergency program to deal with the Depression, but as a sustained political effort to change the institutional and, not incidentally, attitudinal structure of American life. It was a crisis not only of the economy, but you might say a crisis of legitimacy, political legitimacy. Better the occasional fault of a government that lives in a spirit of charity than the consistent omission of a government frozen in the ice of its own indifference. People were not up in arms and uh, demanding some kind of political response. Roosevelt remarked on this repeatedly. He said, this is the greatest crisis our country has faced since the Civil War, and yet the people are docile. They're, they're quiet. They're not demanding from their government uh, some kind of a response. A depression is, is a funny sort of a, of a disaster. It's not, like any, it's not like a hurricane. It's not like a tornado. It's almost the absence of things. For many Americans, it meant that your next door neighbor moved away. You didn't know where. But the house is closed up. The factory is closed up. There's no smoke coming out of the smokestack. It's an eerie, scary, Thing because there's nothing obvious. It's the absence of people. For Roy Stryker and his extraordinary group of photographers, overcoming such apathy was their biggest challenge. Somehow, through the use of pictures, they had to motivate an entire country. Roy Stryker, in 1935, when all this was developing, had only the vaguest notion of what he was doing. Roy was learning on the job. He was learning from the photographers. All the time that Ben was photographing, he not only saw the grimness of things that he was photographing, he also saw the humor of it. And he also saw the pathos of it. Roy had some good pictures of field erosion. And Ben looked at them and he said, well, they're very interesting pictures, but they won't sell anybody anything. Now, if you had a picture of a boy or a family, a poor family that connects poverty with the erosion, that's going to sell people. Well, this file was definitely a propagandistic. There was no question about it. But when you really looked at it, you couldn't stand it. You had to do something. So propaganda to me means a call to do something. The event that we know as the Great Depression, which is conventionally uh, dated from 1929 forward, had really begun in the countryside, in rural America, in about 1920 or 21. Uh, World War I had stimulated a rather considerable expansion of American agriculture, new lands brought under cultivation. And when world agricultural markets restabilized uh, at the end of the war, American farmers found themselves so heavily leveraged with debt and so on, and then commodity prices began to collapse very rapidly as production stabilized in other regions. Of course, when the General Depression kicks in after 1929, the, this widespread, deep agricultural depression merges with the more general so-called Great Depression, and then you've got a crisis of really tremendous proportions on your hands. And so that by the time Franklin Roosevelt is inaugurated in 1933, uh, fully 25 percent of the workforce is unemployed. I used to go around with my camera. I remember photographing bread lines, and you can't, couldn't believe it. These are people who have perfectly good lives and jobs and houses standing in a line for a little bit of stuff to eat. And it was shocking. About 20% of the American workforce was still in agriculture. So one out of every five people who worked, worked on the farm. Roosevelt's short-term goal for, for farmers was to get more income into their hands. 
1933, as a result of the 100 Days legislation when he first comes to power, uh, Roosevelt causes legislation to be passed that calls for the destruction of crops, the plowing up of cotton before it can be harvested so that there's not more of this surplus coming to market and further depressing prices. Now the original language of the, of the law stated that payments to take land out of production were to be divided between the landowner and the tenant, but that was seldom done. In point of fact, in practice, tenants were invited to leave and sharecroppers who had even fewer rights than tenants did were often very summarily put off the land. So you wound up with a lot of displaced people out on the road in jalopies looking for work picking crops, digging potatoes, anything they could do. For many landowners, this was an advantageous situation because you could get a man to work for 10 cents an hour. And you could get a child to work for a nickel an hour. In Washington, Roosevelt's team searched for ways to alleviate the situation, inadvertently made worse by the passage of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Rexford Tugwell, an economics professor from Columbia University, and one of the more radical members of President Roosevelt's original brain trust, lobbied for an agency devoted to relief programs for the poor. They were going to try some collective farms. They were going to try moving some poor farmers from bad land to better land, which is actually where the term the resettlement administration comes from. They were going to resettle people. The agency offered low-interest loans to farmers, sponsored soil conservation, and established experimental farms and migrant camps. Policies like this that put the government in the business of intervening in markets violated all the inherited canons of free market economics. Even to this day, policies that have that kind of character remain controversial in this society, and they were controversial then, not least of all because this, this was brand new. We'd never seen anything like it. It was during this time of political crisis that Roy Stryker was recruited to join the newly formed Resettlement Administration. Roy actually grew up on a small dirt farm outside of Montrose, Colorado. He had grown up very close to the land. His father was very much a, a prairie populist. So he had grown up in a, an atmosphere that questioned the system as it existed and that suggested that government could be used to improve the lives of people. So he was completely comfortable with what he was doing. But not everyone welcomed the administration's new approach. Tugwell knew that these were going to be controversial and he knew that there would have to be some selling done. In the cities, the vast majority of people did not understand what was going on out in the country, didn't have any strong feelings one way or the other, but they might well have seen some of the programs of the farm security, well, particularly the resettlement administration, as socialistic. A collective farm certainly smacks of socialism. A few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. Sometimes they will call it fascism, and sometimes communism, and sometimes regimentation, and sometimes socialism. But in so doing, they are trying to make very complex and theoretical something that is really very simple and very practical. Most Americans had no idea what life was like for migrant workers. And so Tugwell thought it might be a good idea to try to produce some visual evidence of this, and he thought immediately of his friend Roy Stryker. Stryker's relationship with Tugwell began at Columbia University, where he was an assistant professor of economics. Roy was basically a teacher. And he had 
really come into the whole organization as a teacher. But on the other hand, he enjoyed a fight. He's like a little boy that likes to go out and punch his, his, uh, the other kids. Roy loved a fight, and if people were standing in his way, his greatest joy was to get him out of there. <laughs> Roy would have defined patriotism very differently than many people would define it today. Roy's patriotism included the right to question the way things were being done. And certainly by the 1930s, he was very angry about the situation that poor farmers found themselves in. And he really wanted to do something about it. Roy was persuaded by Tugwell to head up the RA's new historical unit, a controversial group of economists and photographers working to bolster support for their programs. Stryker reveled in his role as director, defending the agency against a steady barrage of attacks from conservatives in Congress. I had a tough time for a short while. Some of them were bastards. He didn't give them a goddamn thing, and I got an instinct for that. I can fast figure out who I'm going to get along with and who I'm not going to get along with. That's one of my traits and it was worth its weight in gold. He always had a special enemy and usually the enemy was somebody just above him in Washington who never wanted to give him enough funds to do what he wanted to do. So Roy would think of ways to undermine the sky so he could get the funds. <laughs> and so. In that way, uh, you might call him a devil, but he wasn't. He was always had a, a, a main purpose, way off there somewhere. In the South, you had the tenant farmers problem. In the center, the dust bowl problem. Out in the West, the migrant farmer, and in the Northeast, farm displacement. There really wasn't a section of the country that you could afford to just ignore. Stryker recruited one of his former students, a young photographer named Arthur Rothstein, to help create a strategy for promoting the agency's programs. They began their campaign by taking pictures of everything, people working, living, and suffering. Within a very short time, Roy began to develop a sense of what needed to happen. The picture began to be the thing of my life. The photograph was the way to reach the people. Somehow, some way, I wanted life in the pictures. But what kind of pictures? He knew that the public wouldn't tolerate another round of outright propaganda. There was a, a strong reaction at the end of World War I that the government had been far too involved in propaganda. And for the next 10, 15 years, there was a, a sentiment in Washington, the, there was a backlash. The government should never be involved in propaganda. So the documentary photograph became Stryker's tool of choice. One of the first documentary photographers Stryker sent into the field was Walker Evans. Evans was telling him about the quintessential American material culture. He was particularly aware of this being a moment in time that would not come again. I can't think of any photographer in the United States who was more influential than Walker Evans. Evans called for images that would be a pure record, not propaganda. He made lists of potential subjects that came to look very much like the shooting scripts that Stryker would give to later photographers. At the time, Evans shared a studio in New York City with Ben Shan, who was also working for the RA as a painter. Eager to learn the camera, he turned to Evans for advice. That Evans was about to go off on a trip somewhere. Sean was seeing Evans into a cab. Uh, Evans gets in, rolls down the window to say one last goodbye, and Sean says, in desperation, Walker, 
please tell me just one thing about the camera. Tell me one thing before you leave. And Walker looked out and said, F11 and hold it steady. Ben Sean had been a printmaker for a number of years, but his family had been socialists in Russia. He brought a different spin to the situation than Walker Evans did. Everywhere we went, he was quietly gathering statistics on how people were living. In 1935, Sean and his wife Bernarda travel south to gather photographs that would later inspire posters and murals. What they saw shocked them both. Nearly half the country's African-American population was trapped in a hopeless cycle of sharecropping and tenant farming. Rarely did they grow enough to pay off their debt. They knew that they were in trouble, but they had no notion that anybody was ever going to help them. And they, did, they couldn't read, most of them couldn't read. The, the only thing that they knew was that if they picked so much cotton a day, they were going to get cheated out of a good bit of their money. It was a nasty situation. Only about 5% of African Americans in the 11 former Confederate states uh, were able to exercise the essential democratic political right of the vote uh, as late as the 1930s. So in a country that was already, as a whole, suffering badly from the crisis of the Great Depression, the problems of black America were just horrendous. Dear Roy, the newspapers have distorted the story of the sharecroppers' eviction into an indictment of the AAA program. Actually, very few of the sharecroppers were evicted, and most of them had never seen a benefit payment check. The situation was created when the planters gave the croppers the alternative of getting off the land or remaining as day laborers paying rent in cash and existing on the plantation just as the miners here exist in the company towns. The move to the highways was a public protest against this kind of economic slavery. As the images arrived from the field, Stryker was deeply moved by the dignity and strength buried in the faces of his countrymen. He began to see the potential of creating one of the greatest social documents of his time and looked to the photographers to stretch beyond the goals of the agency and create a complete portrait of their countrymen. John Collier wanted very badly to make pictures that would bring a spotlight to a different kind of American life. Russell Lee's pictures quickly became the backbone of what Stryker affectionately referred to as the file, and eventually came to represent nearly 50% of the collection. Lee used his keen eye for detail and the moments of truth to capture life in the thousands of rural and small towns that he visited. Ultimately, his pictures leave a lasting reminder of where we've been and who we've become. Many of the pictures I took had nothing to do with selling the federal program. It didn't matter because they were getting enough pictures that could directly relate to the program, that they could justify their existence. But in the meantime, they were also gonna do this big file of America and American life that they hoped would have real permanence. I thought to myself, Roy, if you don't watch out, you'll be shooting the whole goddamn USA down to going out to the toilet with them. While Stryker gave the photographers a great deal of creative autonomy, the bureaucrat in him demanded detailed accounts of their whereabouts. Don't go off for two or three weeks and not report. <laughs> you otherwise you're in trouble with Stryker. So I think to a great extent, that's why he and Walker Evans didn't get along too well. Dear Walker, we were quite concerned about you, thinking that perhaps you had been waylaid and were sleeping in some ditch someplace in the South. Where are the negatives for the pictures you took at Westmore? I know you're tired of hearing me say this, but let me again warn you that you must push as hard as We possible. have to operate against a predetermined amount of money. To go over this budget causes severe headaches for some of us here in Washington. I appreciate full well that photography does cost money. But there are some people higher up who haven't yet discovered this. In 1936, 
Evans convinced Stryker to send him to Hale County, Alabama with writer James Agee. Together, they spent eight weeks documenting the plight of the Tingle family. Nearly 40 years later, Walker Evans went back to Hale County with Bill Christenberry. Bill, you said, you know, this is the first and only time I've returned to Alabama since 1936. I do not want to see any of the people that I photographed that may still be living, and they were, there were some at that time. He said it'd be too painful for me to meet any of the people that still live. Walker, and I think this is one of the great strengths of his, his photography, he kept this wonderful kind of distance that would seem necessary. So the pictures never get modeling, they never get overly sentimental. They're just a statement, a great document of what he was experiencing. The work was eventually published in the book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. When you open the book or you go to the first photograph, you don't see a sharecropper. You see Mr. Watson Tidmore, the landowner. Evans was the one who sequenced those photographs of Praise Famous Men. He knew what he was doing. While Evans never returned to Stryker's unit, the pictures he took in Hale County continued to be among the most reproduced images in the collection. What was it, Stryker allegedly said uh, Evans was the first one fired of the F FSA group, and then he said, now go out and make pictures as good as Evans. When Dorothea Lang turned up, and she was personally uh, right on the edge of the worst of the Depression when uh, California farmers lost their land, it was incredible, how could that happen? And I think that the most important thing that Roy was able to do was open people's eyes. Dorothea, strangely enough, photographed to satisfy herself. It was her sensibility that she was concerned in illustrating. It stretched Dreiker's vision for the project because she brought these art qualities to impoverished people. She treated them with dignity and the photographs she made of them. Her photographs were so poignant that you couldn't look at one without wanting to do something about it. The day she did the pea pickers in Napomo, California, she said it was a rainy day. She photographed them, it was a miserable mess, and she drove away, but then had this thought that she wasn't finished there. She went back, this Florence Thompson was camped out at the edge of the camp in a vulnerable position because that's where the police came first to clear people away, and she was there, no means of escape. She was there with small children, no man. And Dorothea Lang just responded to the situation. As soon as she had made the famous photograph, she knew that she had done her work for the day. I think it's one of America's greatest pictures. Mother and child, what more do I need to say? The power of Lang's photographs finally persuaded legislators on Capitol Hill that something needed to be done. The first federally funded housing program for migrant workers entering the state of California was established. Even though the publication of this picture did bring, it seems, some food relief to Napomo a few days later. She had moved on by then. 
But a lot of the children and Florence Thompson herself continue to bear the scars of this very hard period. To this day, Migrant Mother remains one of the most reproduced photographs in the collection. Stryker was relentless in his efforts to get the Resettlement Administration's work seen by as many people as possible. He bombarded newspapers and magazines like Survey Graphic and U.S. Camera with pictures, organized public exhibitions and illustrated books for free. For Stryker, it was all about feeding the file. The first time I met them, I had just started to do photography. And I wasn't really a photographer, I was a, a, a geneticist at the time. I had this whole bunch of photographs I had just taken, and uh, I thought, I'm just going to show them to Roy and see what he says. And so I showed them to him, and Roy looked at him and said, Say, these are great, let's put them in the file. So <laughs> there they are. Louise Roscombe documented the class and racial divisions that surrounded her home on N Street in Washington, D.C., and later captured the hearty spirit of Vermont's towns and countryside. And all of a sudden, this whole world just opened up with people that I had never seen before, things that going on that I didn't know existed. And I could identify with it with the use of a camera. One thing a striker taught you but before you go on a story, be prepared for it. Because things are going to happen that you won't have time to technically get yourself together, but be ready on the instant to shoot, just like that, if that happens, because it may not happen but once. Arthur Rothstein, who first came to the RA to help Stryker organize the unit, quickly became interested in trying his hand at photography in the field. Arthur actually was a part of it in a way because his family came from the group of people who were brought up in the Bronx in New York City in a Jewish community, people who had lost everything. And Arthur began to get a camera with a conscience and um, he made some of his best photographs at that time. One of Rothstein's assignments took him to the Oklahoma Dust Bowl, where he was supposed to illustrate how the deadly combination of bad farming techniques and drought could devastate the land. It was in Cimarron County, in the middle of the Oklahoma Panhandle, that I found one of the farmers still on his land. A single cow stood forlornly facing away from the wind in a dusty field. While making my pictures, I could hardly breathe because the dust was everywhere. It was so heavy in the air that the land and sky seemed to merge until there was no horizon. Just as I was about to stop shooting, I saw the farmer and his two sons walk across the fields. The resulting photograph was used so much that the original negative wore out long ago. It's easy for us, uh, looking back on this period, to forget how different were the t basic terms of life in the American countryside and the American city uh, before the era of the Great Depression and the New Deal. In 1920, a little better than half the population was urban, but just a little less than half, well, about 44 percent, even as late as 1930, of the population is still rural. Now, the difference in the terms of life between rural America and urban America in this era is just tremendous. About 95% of all rural homes had no electricity in the 1920s. Uh, about 80% of them had no indoor plumbing. We're talking about 50 million Americans here. One of Stryker's photographers who helped bridge the gap between the two Americas was Marion Post Wolcott. She had a unique ability to move easily between worlds. Marion Post had a very serious disability. She was a beautiful young woman, and it made it hard 
for Roy and a lot of people to take her seriously. She was a marvelous photographer. But when Roy first took her on, he tended to use her as a public relations resource. So he would send her batting all over a great big region like the South. And she's supposed to stop at this project and that project and say nice things to the, proje to the project director. And she goes on her way and he's smiling for the next six weeks. What he didn't count on was the strength of her commitment to social issues and her talent in translating that into pictures. She always seems to have had a really strong mind about lots of social and political issues, but spoke with her camera more than with words. Even Marion Post diplomacy couldn't smooth over the constant threats against the agency. The photographers, like the program, stirred up controversy wherever they went. The program was not popular with the political bosses with the senators, congressmen who came to Washington, and it took a lot of effort on Franklin Roosevelt's part to keep the agency going. The biggest challenge came in August 1936. It was an election year, and President Roosevelt was once again making New Deal programs the central focus of his campaign. Here in America, we are waging a great and successful war. It is not alone a war against want and destitution and economic demoralization. It is more than that. It is a war for the survival of democracy. 1936 proved to be a bitter campaign year. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. FDR's critics seized every opportunity to discredit New Deal programs, including exploiting the ongoing debate about the work of the historical unit. To support the argument that their pictures were nothing but trumped-up propaganda, opponents zeroed in on a series of photos taken by Arthur Rothstein in Fargo, North Dakota. They asked him to get some pictures that would say drought to people. So he was riding along on one of these little two-lane roads, and he looked over and he saw a cow skull. It was sitting in kind of some hummock grass, and he took a photograph of it in the grassy hummock, and he thought, well, that's pretty good. But he looked over, and there was a partially dried stock pond, and the area that was dried was cracked, had these big cracks, and he thought that might be even better. So Rothstein moved the skull, snapped a single picture, and ignited a firestorm of bad press for Stryker's unit. The worst report came from a newspaper in Erie, Pennsylvania. The revelation that Dr. Rexford Tugwell's resettlement administration, the principal socialistic experiment of the New Deal has been guilty of, flagrantly fake drought pictures, is a highly instructive, but not especially surprising development. The whole resettlement program is a ghastly fake based on fake ideas. There was still a lot of residue of suspicion about the government engaged in wholesale information or propaganda production. It was a big debate in the 30s. Is photography propaganda or information? The Soviet Union pictures differ from the New Deal pictures in their absolute commitment to ideology. Nobody can look poor. Everybody has to be marching forward into the new future. The women have to be strong. The men have to be strong. Everybody looks like the ox that's walking between them. So it's, it's an ideology-driven image. If you look at photographs from the New Deal, many of the pictures they took had nothing to do with selling a federal program. 
As the photographs began to be wider known, people raised objections more frequently. They didn't like the exposés of class issues and they didn't like the racial exposés that were contained in these pictures, but they also thought they were pretty stupid because they showed such commonplace, everyday things and they thought they'd be ridiculed for having funded such a boondoggle. Even from within FDR's administration, many call for the RA's programs to be cut, including funds for the historical unit. At the end of 1936, Stryker's enemies were successful in slicing his funds, forcing him to reduce his team down to just two Washington, D.C.-based photographers. Dear Boss, the fact that little instructions were here on return from the field make me fear that things are going badly for us and for our section, and that you're on your big white horse and once more engaged in heavy battle with our enemies, the publicity boys. As it turns out, Stryker's wings weren't clipped for long. Roosevelt won his second term and boldly renewed his commitment to social reform. I see one third of a nation still proud, still clad, still nourished. Most people, if they're casual students of the period, assume that he's talking there about the one third of a nation that are the immediate victims of the Great Depression. Uh, that's a, that's a, to read that passage or understand that passage in the speech that way is to make, I think, a pretty considerable mistake. At that moment, Roosevelt thought the Depression was close to being ended. And indeed, the unemployment rate at that time was about at its very lowest through the whole decade. But he thought that the country had turned the corner. The end of the Depression was in sight if we weren't there yet. And then he says something extraordinary. But these signs of economic recovery may be portents of disaster. Now, just imagine any modern president labeling an economic recovery as some kind of a potential disaster. What I think Roosevelt had in mind when he said that, the rather surprising statement, was that if the Depression ended before he'd accomplished the job of putting in place programs that would take care of that one-third of a nation who were not just the victims of the passing crisis of the Depression, but the victims of the accumulated history of unregulated industrial capitalism in the United States for the previous century, that then he would have missed his historic opportunity, and that he wouldn't have finished the job. It was at that time that the RA morphed into the Farm Security Administration, and Stryker's photographers went back to work. Despite their new lease on life, the agency's programs were under increasing fire, and the photographers met with resistance in every part of the country. In Alabama, Arthur Rothstein is greeted with hostility. Dear Roy, I think the problem of getting pictures of miners and steelworkers in Birmingham would be too much for even a trained diplomat. Every company town is carefully guarded against outsiders. Last week I got impatient with the proceeding and went over to the Red Ore Mines. Just as I was about to get a shot of one of their hundred armed deputies, a car tried to run me over. Arthur. Dorothea Lang found that she was no longer welcome in the Imperial Valley. The Imperial Valley has a social structure all its own, and partly because of its isolation in the state, those in control can get away with it. The RA have decided to make a crack into the Valley affairs by putting up a camp. Those in control down there are bitterly opposed, and there is trouble ahead. Down there, if they don't like you, they shoot at you, beat you up, and throw you in a ditch at the county line. Back in Washington, Stryker understood that the American landscape was quickly changing and that his time was running out to complete the file. So when Richard Wright approached the agency about a book on the black migration northward in 1940, Roy was, was glad to get involved in this. Lee, Edwin Roscombe, and Jack Delano were sent to Chicago with Richard Wright to witness the arrival of thousands of displaced Southern blacks. When they get to Chicago, what do they find? They find very few jobs. They find cold water walk-up flats that were very crowded. And so 
it's it's a very limited victory there that that they're finding and Richard Wright's very honest about this and the photographs are very honest about this. Gordon Parks was in Chicago at the time photographing for himself but with a similar agenda. I became interested in the poverty I saw on the south side of Chicago amongst the blacks mainly and uh, I contacted Stryker right away. He didn't want to take me on uh, mainly because of all Southern laboratory. And he was afraid that I was going to have all sorts of problems. Then Billy Haygood of the Rosenwald Fund went to see him and said, look, uh, he can take care of himself. So Stracker says, well, uh, if he can prove himself as a, a good photographer and uh, uh, I'm sure that the lab will forget that he is black, <laughs> you know. I never had any trouble with the lab, frankly. But his experience on the streets of Washington, D.C. was very different. I thought Washington, D.C. should be the seat of democracy. That if there's any place where people were treated justly, it would be Washington, and that was rather naive, <laughs> I suppose. Stryker encouraged him to use his camera to somehow put a face on racism and injustice. He said, but you just can't photograph a bigot and write bigot beneath this picture because bigots have a way of looking like anybody else. Sometimes they look a lot better. <laughs> Stryker pointed out a charwoman cleaning the government offices one night, and Ella Watson and her family soon became the focus of Park's first essay. You know, it was what I was feeling. It was, it was my anger, you know, inside. I did it with a subtlety. It was an indictment of the American government. I showed him to Stryker two days later. He said, he smiled, he said, well, you got the idea, but you're going to get us all fired. And I thought that that picture had been destroyed and taken out of the files. It was the first picture that I did there. But it's my, really my first professional picture. And it has become the icon you know, of my career, you know. And I can you know, give Stryker credit somehow or another in inspiring me to do it. It wasn't today. It was a different world. And what Roy did do was to use as many of these pictures as he could, which wasn't very many, but to make sure that the pictures did stay in the file. Because he knew sooner or later America would be ready to look at this. 